Mm -hmm. Our uh, theme scripture for the journey through the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 and 26. I want to invite you to stand with me in reverence for the word of the Lord. And we want to read together uh, these two verses of scripture. Read aloud with me. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. And now I invite you to hold up your copy of the scriptures, whether you've got an old-fashioned tree version that you're flipping through the pages, or whether you've got an E version that you're tapping with your finger. Uh, it's all God's word. Let's hold it up together and repeat this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Give me eyes to see. Give me eyes to see. Ears to hear. Ears to hear. And a heart that is willing to obey your word. The heart is willing to obey your word. Make me a wise builder. Make me a wise builder. To stand firmly upon the rock of your word. To stand firmly upon the rock of your word. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Well, how many of you remember the Beatitudes? <laughs> There's eight of them in case you forgot. As we began this series, I uh, put together a paraphrase of the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to share with you again the Beatitudes as the Lord kind of helped me to see them. If Jesus were to stand before us today, maybe he would communicate the Beatitudes, the beginning of this great message like this. Perhaps Jesus would say, do you know who are truly happy? Blessed with God's favor, our Heavenly Father extends His hand to these, the spiritually humble. Those who don't think too highly of themselves are blessed, for they receive the kingdom of heaven. The sorrowful, those who truly grieve over their sin and the sin of others are blessed, for they will be embraced, comforted, and forgiven by God. Self-control. Those who yield control to God's spirit are truly blessed, for they receive an eternal inheritance that cannot be taken away. The genuine. Those passionate about obedience, pursuing truth in their day-to-day -day lives, are blessed, for they will be satisfied and content in all that they do. The gracious. Those who are compassionate and kind-hearted towards others are blessed, for they receive what they have freely given away. The uncompromising. Those with integrity of heart lived from the inside out are blessed, for they will know God intimately and always be welcomed into his presence. The bridge builders. Those who tirelessly work to resolve conflict and restore relationships rather than choosing sides and separating brothers and sisters are blessed, for they are members of God's family. They are God's children. The victimized. Those mistreated and oppressed for daring to repent and live a genuine life are blessed, for they receive an eternal reward here and now in the kingdom of heaven. As we've gone through the Beatitudes, these eight characteristics of the authentic believer, we've described them just like that, that it's a portrait. This is Jesus' picture of what you and I are to look like. If we are genuine children of God, if we are an authentic Christ follower, a true disciple a true citizen of heaven, then these are the characteristics that are going to be a part of our lives. Matthew begins in chapter 4 telling how Jesus began to go throughout the countryside and that he preached the same message that John the Baptist was preaching. Yeah. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And with that message... Matthew then shows how Jesus goes up on a mountainside, much, much like the one that's here. This is the Mount of Beatitudes there in Israel along the northern Sea of Galilee. And many believe that this is where Jesus brought the crowds to himself. That Jesus seated there 
began to speak these words and he began to paint the portrait of what those who are genuine would look like because he's preaching the message of repentance. Turn towards God. Turn away from living the way you want to live. Begin to live as an authentic, genuine, true believer. That was Jesus' message. Two things that I want you to remember this morning. The genuine are blessed not because of what they do, but because the characteristics of the Beatitudes are placed within them by faith. Jesus is not telling us here, do this to get that. How many of us sometimes read scripture that way? Here's God's promise, and so if I do this, I'm going to get it. No, this is not a do this to get that, but it is a portrait. It's a picture. Jesus is saying, if you are genuine, if you are true, if you're authentic, if you're really my follower, a real Christian, you're going to look like this. You can't fake it. And so... All of the Beatitudes should be evident within our lives. Yet the second thing I hope that you've been discovering through this journey of the Beatitudes is this. The Beatitudes develop or show the progression of maturity within the lives of the genuine. You begin, Jesus has a logical progression within the Beatitudes. You must come to God first and foremost as one who is poor in spirit. That you are spiritually bankrupt. If we think we can achieve righteousness, if we think we can come to God on our own merit in any way, shape, or form, no matter how much we think we have in our spiritual bank account, until we realize we are bankrupt, empty, we can never really come to God. Yeah. And then the Beatitudes continue with a progression, showing us how we are being transformed to become more and more like Jesus because he's placed his spirit within us. And his spirit is enabling us to live as a new creation, Amen. as Paul describes it. Yeah. That if anyone is in Christ, they're what? A new, new creation. New. The old is gone. The new has come. The new is this portrait of the Beatitudes, that this is how we are going to live, and this is how we are blessed, how we are truly most happy. What's the difference between the genuine and the pseudo-Christian? I got to talk with Katie this week. And she shared with me some of her experiences as she was there in Indonesia for uh, a good portion of this summer. And as we talked and uh, shared, I felt like she really needs to share this with you today. And so Katie's going to come and she's going to share some of her experiences that she had uh, as she uh, experienced uh, her personal walk with Christ there in Indonesia, what that looked like for her, what she experienced as she shared with others, and uh, what she found in the hearts and lives of those who were followers of Jesus. So would you welcome Katie as she comes this morning? We're glad that she's a part of our church family. You want to stay down there? Okay, well, I'll let you do that. Yeah, I'm going to stay down here because... I don't know. I just feel awkward up there. <laughs> um, I like being down here where I'm more personal and I can feel like I can look into your eyes more easily. So, um, so yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a picture. Um, I went to Indonesia for two months this summer. And um, to sum it up in a few short words, it completely changed my life just like I thought it would and more. Um, this is actually a picture um, from an island called Sumba, and in this picture there are middle school and high school kids that I had the pleasure of um, working with and discipling for a week, and I got to teach them English, and they were just some of the coolest kids. Um, so, uh, Indonesia. First of all, um, I want to say uh, thank you for all of those who were praying and for all of those who gave your missions dollars into um, this opportunity for me and for people in Indonesia to hear the gospel. Um, you are a blessing, and I'm sure that um, you will be blessed through that, and I know the kingdom is growing through that sacrifice that you've made. So thank you so much for um, just for your prayers and for your giving. Um, I really appreciate it. But um, as I talk about Indonesia, First, um, I want to ask, is anyone like, 
a numbers person. <laughs> like you, I know that like Sean and Pearl and Kelly should all be like, yeah, raising their hands because they teach math. But is anyone here like, yeah, I like numbers, I like statistics, I do the finances in like my home or most of the finances, or yeah, I'm, I just understand numbers, I get it. Okay, I saw some hands. Um, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I hate, I can't stand math. I just, I don't, I don't get it. But sometimes it really is um, a good perspective for me to hear some statistics about, you know, certain cultures or certain people groups or even just like, I don't know, people have statistics for like baseball. I don't know, sometimes that helps me even though I watch baseball maybe once, one game a year. But um, yeah, it's good to know statistics. So um, the percentage, here's a statistic for you, the percentage um, among religions in Indonesia, to give you a perspective, um, the country is 86% Muslim, um, which is a big percentage. <laughs> That's kind of um, near the percentage of what most Americans would call themselves Christian here. So it's a little um, diverse in that way. And then in Indonesia, there are 86% Muslim and 7% Christians. So 7% of people in Indonesia say they're Christians. And that's kind of um, a little bit of a challenge for me to think of myself as living in that kind of country if I were that much of the minority. You know what I mean? Like here, I feel like I could go to the grocery store and I could start, you know, talking about Jesus to someone, and then they're quick to say, oh yeah, I'm a believer too. Like, that's actually very common if you're outward in your faith in public. Like, a lot of people will say, oh yeah, me too, I'm a Christian. A lot of people here are just, you know, open about saying, I'm Christian. Whether they really, they really are a follower of Jesus or not, many people would say they're Christian. So being in a nation where most people are very outward in saying, I'm a Muslim, it was very, very different for me. A very, very vulnerable place. Um, so some of you might be asking, like, I don't really understand what Islam is. Like, um, and I didn't either <laughs> until I was, you know, just surrounded by it. Um, some basic principles of Islam is um, that it is a very legalistic religion. So people are brought up into this religion where they are taught that they have to, um, and these are literal things, they have to clean themselves before they even pray. Before they even approach God, they literally have to go to this basin filled with water, and they have to put water on themselves and just cover themselves with water and clean themselves before they can even go into a prayer room to pray to God. And um, not only that, but they have to face a certain direction. Um, there's certain times of the day that are designated for prayer. Um, they have to uh, they have to wear certain things. A lot of the women have to wear head coverings. Some of the men wear uh, these caps. And it's just very legalistic. And in order to seek access to God, you have to do these things. There's absolutely no other way. So. Um, it's actually a very heartbreaking religion to be around, just to see these people who are in such bondage of knowing, like, I will never fulfill all the aspects of the law, but I'm going to do it because it's all that I know how to do. Um, so, yeah. Uh, anyway, that's some background about Islam for you, just to give you kind of a basis. Um, but what my team and I were doing in Indonesia, there was about a team of um, me and like four other interns, uh, most of our ministry was just going out into college campuses and praying over the campus. And uh, it's not like Ohio where it's like Kent and there's just one university in Kent. We were in a city where there were 70 universities, 70, 70 universities. So we had a lot of options to go and pray at different places. Um, and we would go and pray over the campus, just, you know, that God would set these people free from, uh, you know, the, the, the bonds of legalistic religion and 
that we would pray that, you know, God would give them a vision of who he truly is and how he can set them free. But not only would we pray over the campus, we would make an, a big effort to go and just sit with people and talk to them about Jesus and share our testimonies and ask them about their lives and build relationships with them. So through this, uh, I don't know, meet and greet um, venture that we did through prayer walking, uh, the amazing thing is I've done like a lot of the calculations and I've counted the phone numbers that we received through doing this and we were able to share the gospel and our testimonies with 300 college students in a span of two months. And I still think back to that and I'm like, God, how in the world did that happen? Like, I don't even, re I didn't even realize at the time that that's how many people heard the gospel and now I'm just rejoicing over it. Um, and I will say, like last week, we talked a lot about persecution, right, and how, you know, blessed are the persecuted, and um, God, and uh, Jesus even goes into elaborating on it. And I will say I, ha I have not experienced persecution before in my life, um, like I did in Indonesia, and it wasn't necessarily like um, I was abused or, you know, you know, stuff that happens in really radical parts of the world. This is a very peaceful nation, but we would go up to people and it felt like every day we would have someone or some group of people just laugh in our faces and walk away when we told them about Jesus. I remember my, my one friend, Miguel, who was an intern from Texas, he went up to this group of guys and he was talking to them and um, they ended up thinking he was really cool because he was a uh, a bule, which means uh, like a, a foreigner in um, Indonesian. So they get really excited when foreigners come and are talking to them. They thought Miguel was so cool. And then Miguel was like, oh yeah, so, you know, let me tell you about uh, Jesus and what he's done for me. And they straight up just laughed in his face as soon as they heard the word Jesus. And, um, you know, he, <laughs> they pretty much just walked away from the conversation. But it was so cool because the way he saw it, he was brokenhearted for those people. But at the same time, he rejoiced a little bit because he's, you know, he has this mindset of if I'm truly being persecuted for sharing the gospel, that means I'm doing what God wants me to do. Like that sign of persecution is a sign that, you know, the enemy is going to try to get to you and he's going to try to stop you because you're doing what God is calling you to do. And so we had to experience that. On almost a daily basis, we would have people just brush us off and laugh at us and all of this stuff. But even in that, there were so many blessings because we would not only meet people like that, we would meet people that were genuine truth seekers. People who really, like as soon as we started to talk about Jesus to them, they just wanted to hear more and more about it. Um, I remember a time when me and my friend Katie... <laughs> Kind of confusing but it was me and a friend named katie and we went up to this uh group of three girls and um this one girl's name was esme and uh we started talking to them you know about asking them about their lives like, so what do you go to school for what's your major like um asking them if they have any brothers or sisters building you know a good conversation with them and then they asked us the same things, like, so why are you here? Like, why are you in Indonesia? And that kind of opened up an opportunity for us to eventually tell them about Jesus. And so we started talking to this girl, Esme, about Jesus. And her face, like, lit up. And it was so beautiful to be able to tell her, like, so, you know, we're all sinful and we're all unclean, but we believe in Jesus and he's made us clean. And she kind of started to say, yeah, but that's only for you. Like, God only saves. Jesus is only for Christians. Like, Jesus only died for Christians. And my friend Katie just opened up to her and said, no, Jesus died for you. Like, specifically for you. And just the look on it, she started to, like, cry. And she was like, wow, I had no idea that Jesus died for me, too. And she opened herself up to the gospel that day. Um, so uh, it's really different, though, from sharing the gospel with Indonesians than sharing the gospel with um, Americans. I feel like with Americans, um, I'm guilty of this in a lot of ways. I try to spruce up the gospel. I try to use a lot of good words. I try to, you know, 
it's awful. It, I try to almost market the gospel. I find myself doing that in some ways, like, yeah, Jesus is awesome, like, blah, blah, blah. But literally talking to Indonesians, they have limited, a limited amount of English language knowledge. So sharing the gospel with them is literally just telling them a story in the most simple terms you can, in the most concise way. And then seeing them come to faith just by hearing the simple gospel is an absolute amazing thing. And it convicts me, you know, like how often do I just go back to the simple gospel? Like how often do I just stop and think about, wow, Jesus died for me. He took all my sin and my shame away. And I try to make it so complicated. I try to make it so that, you know, I, I have to focus like, okay, I need to like fix this part of my life and I got to do it all on my, all on my own and I got to, you know, do this and, I, and, you know, there's this thing I have to worry about and I always get so frustrated and I forget to just go back to the simple gospel, the very thing that brought me into faith, the very thing that Jesus saved me by and I just, you know, I think um, with Indonesians, a lot of the times that's the knowledge they have, like especially the people I spoke with in Indonesia, they're young in the faith. They pretty much just know the gospel and they're learning. But man, <laughs> they have so much faith. I will even go as far to say as those people who simply know the gospel have more faith than a lot of the American Christians I've ever met. Because they are, they know that past of trying to please God by doing all of these rules and laws and they know how binding that is and they know how frustrating that is and they know that they hate having to wash themselves before they pray. They hate having to uh, fast because of stupid reasons that I will tell you about in a few minutes. They just hate this constant uh, ritual of doing things for God and never feeling the satisfaction that they want. So when they finally find the gospel, they feel so much freedom in that freedom that Jesus has taken care of it all for them, and they just have access to God. Um, I want to tell you a couple stories about some people that I met in Indonesia. The first one um, is about a girl named Nana, and she's awesome. She's the one on the right. Um, she actually became one of my best friends in Indonesia. Um, so Nana grew up in a Muslim home. Her entire family was Muslim. Her entire tribe was Muslim, actually. Um, but she came to know Jesus when she was, uh, I believe she said, like a young teenager, 13 or 14. And that was because someone had told her mother the gospel, and her, and her mother believed in Jesus, and her mother taught her about Jesus. So she came into the faith. And uh, so she is a Christian. And in her early 20s, she entered this relationship um, with a guy who she thought really loved her, who she thought you know would take really good care of her. And for a while he did, and then he started to gradually get abusive towards her. And there were countless times where he would really beat her up and he would uh, rape her like countless times. And, and she was pretty much left with nothing but Jesus. He stole all of the money that um, she had and he pretty much starved her um, and it was just a really rough life for her for a few <coughs> years. Um, at one point she ended up getting pregnant and she gave birth to a son who is on the left there. And he's so cute. Um, she sent me that picture this morning and I was like, okay, I have to put that up there. Uh, but um, so she had this son, and she was still in this abusive relationship, and she felt like Jesus was just telling her, if you really love me, you will trust me enough to protect you, and you will get out of this relationship. And so she, as I said, she clung to the gospel, she clung to Jesus, and she believed in Jesus that he would protect her, and she ended up getting out of that relationship. And for a long time, she didn't hear anything from uh, her ex. She didn't hear from him. She was living with her parents. Things were going well for her and her son. Um, and then one day, her ex got a hold of her, I think, by a phone call or something. And he told her, Nana, um, I really want to apologize for everything I've done for you. I've realized I've done so much wrong to you, and I've just 
been a horrible person to you. Please come over to my house and let me make you and our son dinner so I can apologize. And so she had so much forgiveness in her heart for this man. She, wow, I just, she's a big inspiration to me. She had so much forgiveness in her heart that she was like, okay, yeah, I'm happy to, you know, go and reconcile this. So she went over to his house and, and she found out that he just was not what he was portraying to her. He, she found out that he wanted revenge over her. And in fact, um, I will tell you that in Indonesia, it's a very spiritually dark place. People practice a lot of witchcraft and a lot of spell casting and cursing. And so she went to his house that night and this man um, placed curses on her, curses that she would be paralyzed and just curses that you would not even believe for her and her son, which was his son. And so he found out like, wow, this isn't, this isn't working. She's supposed to be really sick right now or, you know, something like he was learning that these powerful dark forces were not working on her. And then, so he said, okay, fine, I'm going to take this into my own hands. I'm going to poison her and the boy. So he placed poison in their food. And absolutely nothing happened to her and the boy. Because God was so powerful on her and protecting her so much. Wow, like, how awesome is Jesus, right? That he's able to give us a spirit of forgiveness in our heart, and then when we have that forgiveness for others, he protects us from schemes of the enemy, right? So in all of Nana's story, there was some definite persecution going on there, and it was not persecution for something that she deserved. It was this uh, righteous persecution that Pastor was talking about, persecution for someone being righteous, because this woman was following Jesus. This woman was clinging to the gospel and clinging to Jesus, and yet this guy did not like that about her. And so I wonder in today's America, like, I'm sure these kinds of things happen, but if that happened to me, like, how tempted would I be to just say, Jesus, this is not working out. Like, I've been wrong so much, and I've you know, so much crap has happened to me. Like, that's really, this seems like a moment of truth to me, to discovering, like, am I a pseudo-Christian or am I a true follower of Jesus? And in places like Indonesia, you can't afford to be a pseudo-Christian. You might as well just be, you know, a Muslim or a Buddhist or something else because, you know, if you're a true Christian, you have to be strong in the faith or you'll just lose everything. So, um, that's not my story, and um, I had the pleasure of texting her this morning, and she was telling me about her son, and how he's the smartest boy in his class, and he's perfectly healthy, and he's growing so much, and it's just awesome to see what God is doing in their lives, and, he's still, and since then, he's delivered Nana from even having any contact with that man anymore, and so he's not, she's not in danger of that, and neither is her son. It's so awesome that even when we're in persecution, God just completely protects us if we're willing to surrender to him and everything. And so, um, there's one other story I want to tell. And that is one of Noor. <laughs> she was awesome. Um, her name is Noor, N-U-R. Um, it's short for something really long and complicated that I'm not going to try to pronounce right now. Uh, but Noor is a delight. Um, we first met Noor in our prayer walking. That's how we met her. We met her through our prayer walking and going to meet people on the campuses. And uh, so she seemed uh, really enthused in uh, this English center that we have in the city. It's a center where people can come and learn English for free and practice their English. And so she was really excited about that. She said, okay, I'm going to go to that English center and practice English with some Americans. She was very excited about that. So I said, okay, I'll have, you know, an English hour with you, and we'll just sit, and we'll talk, and we'll practice English. And of course, in the back of my mind, I was like, I'm going to tell you about Jesus, but no, I didn't say that outright. Um, but anyway, so Nora comes in to the English Center one day, and I have this uh, English session with her, 
And, you know, she just opens up to me about her life. She tells me how many brothers and sisters she has and, you know, her favorite foods, her favorite colors, you know, all those basic things. And then she goes into telling me more about her past, more um, personal details. And I learned that she grew up in a Muslim family. And when she turned eight years old, her parents sent her off to um, an Islamic boarding school, which those are very bad places. Um, those are places where n not all of the kids have a bed, and in order to have a bed, you have to race kids to get a bed, and the beds aren't really beds, they're just a piece of blanket on the floor. And the same thing with food, if you don't get to the food fast enough, and other kids eat all of the food before you. And you're pretty much brought up and trained to be uh, a Muslim. I won't say a radical Muslim, but a very dedicated Muslim. You're taught all of the laws and you're trained in them. And so I learned that not only did Noor go to an Islamic boarding school, but she is now a student at an Islamic university studying Islamic law. <laughs> and when I heard that, I pretty much thought to myself, this is the most Muslim girl I have probably ever met in my life. She's such a peaceful and soft-spoken girl, but I know that she knows the Quran like front to back, like perfectly. This is just what she knows. This is probably the majority of what she knows is Islamic law. And so I end up finding out all of this stuff about her. And I was able to open up to her and share my testimony about what Jesus has done for me and um, the gospel as well. And I, at the end of our conversation, I said, Noor, um, I really want to get to know you more. What do you say we like hang out a couple times a week or something? And she was like, sure, that sounds awesome. I, I definitely want to keep hanging out with you. But at this time, it was the holiday of Ramadan. And if you don't know what Ramadan is, it's, a ho it's an Islamic holiday where um, Muslims fast from dawn to dusk. So when the sun goes down, they don't eat. Or when the sun comes up, they don't eat until the sun goes down. So they don't eat lunch, basically, or snack throughout the day. And so I was trying, so she said, yeah, let's hang out. But I was trying to think like, okay, how can we hang out around the time of Ramadan? I can't like have lunch with her. Maybe I could have a late dinner with her. And then she just says something to me that kind of blew me away for a second. She, <laughs> and I kind of really didn't expect it. She pretty much, she told me, she's like, I can have lunch with you sometimes this, sometime this week because I'm on my menstrual cycle. And I was like, what? <laughs> this girl, I just met her, and she's opening up to me about her lady business. Um, and so I had to ask her, like, so you, you, you don't fast when, when that's happening? And she's like, oh, no, no woman does that. Because if, you know, if there's any kind of blood being poured out, then, you know, we're technically unclean. And that goes for any person, like, if someone has a bleeding injury, then they cannot fast or pray to God, or if somebody is sick, they cannot fast or pray to God. So if anyone is going through any of these things, they have zero access to God. And as she was telling me this, I almost cried. And so, and she was like, um, so you act really surprised, like isn't that the same for um, people who follow Jesus? And I just had to tell her, no, it's totally different. Like let me tell you about what Jesus has done, and I laid out the gospel for her again, and uh, her face like lit up, and she uh, seemed really thrilled about, thrilled and confused. It's hard for Muslims to get the concept of pure forgiveness, but at the same time, they love the idea of it. They love the idea that, you know, if Jesus lived this perfect life and he was the sacrifice for my not so good life, then I don't have to do all these rituals anymore to have access to him. And so I hung out with Nora a couple times, and then one night she came to our uh, Christian worship service and Bible study. She just showed up. And this is a big deal, because if Muslims are seen going to Christian worship services and Bible studies, by if other Muslims see them, they will be completely ridiculed um, maybe even their like safety will be in danger. Uh, so this was a big deal that she stepped out and was just so desirable to know more about Jesus that she came to our Bible study. 
And I went up to her and I said, so Noor, um, I'm so happy you're here. And I'm also kind of surprised. And she said, I will never forget her saying this. She was like, you said so many good things about Jesus that I want to know more. Aww. And so, <laughs> dang it, I'm going to start crying. I told myself I'm going to cry. Um, but it's just so awesome. Like, I almost had so many doubts. Like, this girl for 28 years has been brought up in training to be a Muslim. And just in two months I had with her, she kept growing and I kept having conversations with her about Jesus. And I saw her heart open up so much to the gospel. And I had so many doubts, like, Jesus, I don't know if I'm going to see this girl make any change. I mean, I'm only here for two months. And she's been trained to be a Muslim for 28 years. Like, And now I'm so repentant of having those doubts because I've seen Jesus open her heart so much. And I've seen the power of the, just this simple gospel that brings people to Christ that saves and I feel so awful for letting myself get so caught up in, like, I have to know this theology, and I have to know this theology, and I have to know about this old law and all of the um, specifics of it. Because, no, the simple part of following Jesus is just going back to the gospel every minute of every day. And when I see these Indonesians and what they've been through and the faith that they have just in knowing the gospel. Man, that's convicting to me. So um, that's pretty much all I have to share. I hope, um, I don't know, I hope this has given you some kind of perspective also into the Beatitudes. Like when I think of Noor, I think of the one that says, blessed are, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because she's a true truth seeker. If like, if she just wants to follow whoever God is, if Jesus gave her a vision of who she was, I know she would drop every single Islamic thing she ever knew and just follow him because she hunger and thirst for righteousness and she's a truth seeker. All because she is starting to believe in the gospel, just the gospel. So I hope, like, um, you just take some time in your day and in every single day after this to just go back to the gospel whenever you're feeling, you know, distraught or discouraged. Just go back to the gospel. If we go back to the gospel, just the simple gospel, we will have so much less of that. <laughs> because these people in Indonesia are some of the most faithful people I've ever met. And it's so obvious that it's just because they go back to the gospel every day. Um, so that's all. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
better than other Christians. Whether we see them as a pseudo-Christian or a genuine follower of Christ, we are not better than they are. We're just walking with Jesus. Guard ourselves against spiritual pride. Mm-hmm. Think that we're better than others. Secondly, Jesus said, Blessed are those for, who mourn, for they will be comforted. We came to realize that this is not just the typical mourning or grief over some loss, whether it be a death or whether it be the loss of a job, loss of a home, whatever the loss might be. It's not that type of mourning, but it is to mourn over sin. To mourn over our sin and to mourn over the sin of the world, the wickedness that abounds. Those who mourn, the genuine, have to be on guard against becoming insensitive. Then those who have a broken and a contrite heart will not allow themselves to have a heart that is again hardened by sin. Jeremiah put it this way, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can know it? May we always have that humility before God, that spiritual poverty that says, Lord, examine my heart. Don't let that pride be there. Don't let my heart become hard to my own sin or the sin that is in the world. Keep me soft. Keep me sensitive and aware of how I can so easily break my relationship, break covenant with God, break covenant with other believers, because that's really what sin is, is breaking covenant. Mm-hmm. It's going against what God desires for us in our lives. Third thing, I'm going as quickly as I can. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Mm-hmm. The genuine have to guard against acting with human wisdom and strength. Katie spent a month in Germany, I think it was, before she went to Indonesia. And they were being trained and instructed in how that they can do that. But more than the training, I know too, they spent some time in prayer. They had to become sensitive to the Holy Spirit. They had to be aware of God's voice leading them, guiding them, and directing them in every conversation. Because if they responded in human wisdom with their own strength and their own understanding... If they, if they went in a direction they thought they should go and it wasn't the direction God was leading them, they could find themselves in a heap of trouble really fast. Right. And so the meek surrender their strength, surrender control to God in all their ways. And yet, when spiritual pride comes into our life, I mean, that's the, that, that, that's the basis right there. When we begin to think we know something, We'll begin to act in our own strength, in our own understanding, in our own knowledge, our own power instead of God's. We must guard against responding and acting according to what we think is best, but always trust God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. They're going to they're be completely satisfied, Jesus said. When you really long to, to know righteousness, to pursue truth, to, to seek after me, you're going to find it. You're never going to go wanting. Yet the reality is the genuine have to guard against self-righteousness. We can never think we've arrived. That, 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 that I've got it all together now. Thank God. Praise God. I'm, I'm free from sin. I am free from sin. He has made me a new creation in Christ. But I'm totally still dependent upon him. The life, Paul put it this way in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live for the Son of God by by the power of His Spirit living in me. So it's not my self-righteousness, it's not what I can do. I go from, from understanding the gospel and understanding that Jesus died for me, but now I must lay down my life so that He can live His life through me. And when I give of myself, he enables me to be satisfied, full, content, because I'm pursuing truth. I'm hungry and thirsting for righteousness. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Forgive as you have been forgiven. Yeah. And yet the reality is we have to guard against becoming judgmental. Mm-hmm. Having a critical spirit holding on to bitterness and resentment. May we not judge one another 
but may we always be filled with mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. We, 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 we saw how the pure of heart are those who have a single-minded focus, that their devotion is upon the Lord. And so if we are genuine, we always have to be on guard against becoming double-minded. James said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and he will give it to you, and that God will give it fully, completely to you, unless you're double-minded. Mm -hmm. Then you're like a wave tossed in the sea. Yeah. You're like the one who is the man that looks in a mirror, but immediately forgets what he looks like. Because you're not applying the word of God in how you live your life day in and day out. You're no longer single-minded, but double-minded. You're in the world and you're living like the world. Instead of, as Jesus said, you're in the world, but not of it. May we always have that single-minded devotion to Christ, to be pure in heart. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. We, we, we saw that peacemakers are those who make peace. They're actively engaged in not making peace as in an absence from conflict or war, but they are coming to make people whole and complete. That, that as Katie was sharing the gospel in Indonesia, what she was doing was sharing the reality that those who are broken, those who are bound in sin and legalism, those who are bound up by a false god. I, I hope you were aware of that, that when she referred to the, the, to the Islamic god, that is not the same god. That's a god with a little g. God who is no god at all. He is nothing. And they suddenly realized they could come to the God, to Jehovah, to, to the living I am, to Jesus. And that there's freedom and liberty. They go from brokenness to wholeness. And there's a desire within the human heart to be made whole. Mm -hmm. To find peace with God. That they have access. So Katie was acting as a peacemaker. She was bringing peace, wholeness to others. And they were responding to it. But the reality is the genuine, the authentic follower of Jesus has to guard against apathy. Katie wondered that about the one young lady. Would, would she ever change? Does, does the gospel have the power to really bring peace to her life? She, she, she knows more about the Quran than I know about the Bible. Maybe she had that thought. I don't want to put words in her mouth. But, but she was so well educated. And yet the gospel is not without power. May we not have our hearts grow cold. We should never, never give up. If you have a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter that's not following Jesus, their life is incomplete. Their life is broken. Continue to pray. Continue to believe. Never, never give up. Don't become apathetic, but make peace. When you see conflict, when you see differences amongst uh, fellow believers, don't give up and throw your hands in the air, but, but pursue peace. Pursue wholeness in our relationships. So that we are united in all things. We can't allow ourselves to just throw in the towel. We must always pursue peace. And then finally, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Katie expressed it when she was talking about it was Noonan, right? No. No, no. Almost like man enough. <laughs> Here's a young lady who's experiencing persecution like you and I will have, have never experienced. To have people cursing you, wanting to poison you, take your life, to harm you because you want to be a follower of Jesus. And yet she didn't despair. She didn't give up. She wasn't filled with regret, but she rejoiced that she could participate, as the scripture says, in the sufferings of Jesus. And so the genuine have to guard against discontentment. Why me, God? Woe is me, God. I, I've suffered so much. We've never suffered like Jesus. And that's why the disciples, when they were being persecuted, when they were being thrown in prison, as James was uh, 
killed with the sword as Stephen was stoned. They could rejoice that they shared in the sufferings of Jesus because he said, if they persecuted me, they're going to mistreat you too. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. So we can never let ourselves give in to resentment. But we must always rejoice because our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so as we conclude today, as we, as we think about the things that Katie shared from her experience there in Indonesia, and as she was able to share the gospel with people and, and, and see those things, what might the Holy Spirit say to us today? Four questions for you to think about. First is really the most important. Have you personally responded to the gospel? That you are a genuine child of God. That you are an authentic Christ follower. That you are a true citizen of heaven. That you have responded to the message of repentance because you know you're bankrupt before God. You, you are poor in spirit. It's only those who are poor in spirit that can respond to the message. Because as long as you continue to think you have any merit of yourself, it will keep you from coming to God. May we respond to the gospel. Secondly, from just the limited stories that Katie has shared this morning, how would you say that we as Christians in America compare to those in Indonesia? What might be the differences? What might be the similarities that maybe you see from the things that she shared or from the things that you've read? Are we measuring up as genuine children of God? Or are we lacking? Third, according to the Beatitudes, what's your maturity level? Are you growing and developing? Jesus isn't going to have you come to faith and immediately have you have to face death. It's going to be very unlikely. When we face persecution, it's going to be because he gives us grace in that moment. But those who live in Muslim countries, those who, those who live in these kind of places, they understand that if I take this step of faith, if I go to a Bible study and identify myself in any way with Christians, I, I face the possibility of rejection, of being belittled, of being called names. They count the cost before they even make the decision. Have we counted the cost? What's our maturity level? Are we growing? What might be lacking in your life? And how is the Lord helping you to mature, to grow, so that all of the Beatitudes are fully developed and fully complete in you, that you are like Jesus? And then finally, as we quickly went through the things we need to guard against, what might it be that the Lord would say, you need to be on guard against this. This is what's trying to creep into your life to, to cause you to turn away from me, to, to not be the authentic person that I want you to be. That If you don't take care, you would find yourself being a pseudo-Christian, not the authentic genuine. What is it that you, what is it that I need to guard against? As we conclude today, I want to encourage you to think about sharing with a group of two or three or four this morning and say, you know, here, here's what the Lord is saying in my heart and life. And we will take time to pray one for another. That as we go through this next week, we do it in the power of the Spirit. Aware that Jesus has put his hand upon our lives, he's given us his Spirit so that we are complete and not lacking anything. And that we can grow to maturity. You have to go today go in the peace and strength of the Lord, but be sure to take that little sermon note, insert with you and talk about it with your family. Put up a post on Facebook and, and see if you can't get some of your Facebook friends to dialogue with you about what it means to be authentic as a follower of Jesus. We need to talk about these things and pray about these things one together, one, one with another. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for Katie's story. Lord, many of us play a part in helping her to be able to go and to be able to be in that place Lord, we sent her out as one of our own. And we rejoice with her, Lord, that the gospel is not without effect and that she was able to be used of you. And Lord, you've used the stories that she was able to share with us this morning 
to help us to see the reality of the difference between the authentic and genuine follower of Christ as to those that are the pseudo-Christian, those who are following you only in name but not in the way they live their lives. Lord, we want to be more like you. So as we have opportunity to share together, as we pray one for another, may, Lord, you help us to surrender more and more, to grow, to be mature, to be fully like Jesus. May your blessing, Lord, rest upon each one. Truly let your word be a, a light unto our feet and a lamp for our path that, Lord, we can truly have the light to see clearly, to walk in obedience to your word. We give you thanks and praise in the strong name of Jesus and everyone says, Amen. 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 God bless you. I love you. Have a great day. Amen. <laughs>